Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wake up, wake up. I know it's hot, but I got a word for you guys today. Hallelujah. I just want to thank and praise Yahweh Almighty, the one who sits high and looks low on me. And I thank him for his word, and I pray that it go forth and accomplish that which I would have it to accomplish in each individual person's life today. So before we get into the message, I brought a little video clip that I would like you guys to watch. And maybe by watching the clip, you'll be able to guess what we're talking about today. See how sharp you are. amazing, right? So what are we talking about today? We're talking about dominoes, right? I mean, I just want you to think for a minute, how long do you think it would take to set something like that up? It was a four minute video, but how many hours would have to go into setting this up? And I want you guys to know that if just one domino was not lined up properly, if it didn't connect with the one next to it, the whole thing would be a fail. So just imagine when they're putting this together, they're probably hoping with everything in them that it's successful. They're videotaping it. They add these to competitions and different things. So just imagine getting like almost all the way through and then one connection is missed 
and the whole thing is an epic fail, right? When it's successful, it's like, ha, ah, that was so great. But when it messes up, it's like, oh, they got to set the whole thing back up again just to start from the beginning. So we're talking about dominoes today, right? You guys don't seem too excited about dominoes. What I really want to talk about is something called the domino effect. So the domino effect is a cumulative effect produced when one event initiates a succession of similar events. It's oftentimes called the ripple effect, how one thing affects the next, affects the next, affects the next. So we're talking about the domino effect today. So I started thinking about this and just kind of meditating on it. And I was thinking about how in recent messages, I've talked about how the word of Yahweh is Yahweh's plan of redemption. You guys remember that? So we're talking about how the whole Bible is Yahweh's plan to redeem his people back to himself, right? The whole Bible. So from Genesis in the beginning to Revelation, the revealing of Yeshua Messiah at his second coming, the whole thing is Yahweh's plan of redemption. But it gets even better than that because I started thinking about the fact that the scripture says that Yeshua was slain from the foundation of the world. Do you even understand what this means? Can you even begin to fathom what this means? This means that Yahweh gave us a solution before there ever was a problem. I mean, come on, saints. Who but y'all can do this, right? You want to know how great our God is? He can give a solution to a problem before the problem even exists, right? And so it says that Yeshua was slain from the foundation of the world. So Yahweh made a decision to save us before he even created us. He made a decision to send Yeshua to be that sacrifice for us before we ever were born, right? Yeshua was already the solution to the problem. That was the beginning of this domino effect. He set all things into motion right there. The whole rest of scripture is just that decision being played out for us in real time. From beginning to to end. We talked about how in the scripture, when we look at people, places, and things, the scripture is not really about those people, places, and things. It's about Yeshua and him come to redeem us, a fallen man, right? So when we look at those stories, we need to see how Yahweh's speaking to us. Now, I've oftentimes heard people refer to the word of Yahweh as Yahweh's love letter to us. I'll admit I didn't always get it, but now I'm starting to get it. Because on the surface, Yahweh's word is good. On the surface. If you just took it literally word for word on the surface, it would be some good stuff, right? But Yahweh desires intimacy with us. And so he has hidden throughout scripture all these little facets and nuggets of truth and deeper understanding and more intimacy for us. It's just like when you play your video games and you stumble across some gift, you get free points or an extra life or you get excited about that, right? Well, the word of Yahweh is just like that. I want you to know that the whole Bible is Yahweh's plan of redemption. But for those who desire deeper relationship with him, those who want to go beyond a surface level relationship, those who want to dig deep into the word, he has given us the plan of salvation over and over and over and over again. We see it in Noah. We see it in the Exodus. We see it in the feast days. We see it in the tabernacle. We see it in the parables and the miracles. We see it all the way through scripture. And I was thinking about the fact that he gives us the plan over and over and over and over again. But why? Why do you think he needs to give us the plan over and over and over again? Because we are forgetful people. We forget that Yahweh, the omnipotent one, has a plan and that nothing or no one can stand in the way of the plan. Everything will connect just like it should because Yahweh's plan is sure. So that means that whatever battles we face, the victory's already won, right? If we're on the side of Yahweh. Because Yahweh wins. There's no way he can lose. There's no way that thing's not going to connect just the way he would have it to connect. Yahweh is victorious, and in him we are victorious also. 
So I was thinking about how when we're going through trials and tribulations and setbacks and disappointments and struggles and temptations and all of these things that seek to hinder us from making the connection we need to make to continue on the straight and narrow path, when all of those things are happening, we need to remember that the battle's not ours, it's Yahweh's, and that victory is assured. And no matter what it looks like, Yahweh is, hallelujah. And we are going to be what he would have us to be and do what he would have us to do do and accomplish his plan and his purpose in this life. So I was really excited about this because this is the domino effect. So I brought along another picture and I want us to look at this picture, but I'm going to give us two different perspectives of the same picture just to show that, you know, when people look at stuff, we don't all see the same thing, but I'm going to give you two scenarios. So in the first scenario, In the beginning, Yahweh created the heavens and the earth, everything in the earth, above the earth, below the earth, everything he created, right? And he created man in his image and likeness. And we were very good, he says. We were the crowning jewel of all his creation. He made us perfect. We were able to walk with him and talk with him, right? That's how he started us out with Adam and Eve. And so we were the righteous. And then one day, Adam and Eve decided to make a choice, and it was a very bad choice. They decided to disobey Yahweh. I want you to understand that their disobedience made them unclean. Their disobedience put them in darkness. Their disobedience was the catalyst for the fall of all the rest of us. See, when they fell, we all fell right? When they fell, all of mankind went down, right? So it was a domino effect. One choice, one decision, and all of humanity is paying the price for it to this day. That's one perspective. I'll call that perspective disobedience. Well, let's look at the other perspective. Salvation. So, in salvation, I, who was darkness, And I'm not saying we're in darkness. You guys remember that Pastor Beth brought a whole message on we were darkness, not we were in darkness. You who were once darkness. You were darkness. Okay, you were darkness. We're the darkness, right? And somewhere along the way, we came to the realization that we were darkness and we were exposed to the light, be it through a friend, through the word, through a song, a ministry. We were exposed to the light of Yahweh and we were drawn to it. We desired it. And so we made a proclamation of faith that we wanted what Yahweh had for us, that we believed that he was who he said he was. We believed that we were sinners in need of a savior. We believed that he was able to save us to the utmost. We wanted his atoning sacrifice for the remission of our sins personally. And we made a choice. We made a choice to lay down our lives and take his life on to lay down our darkness and our filthiness and our uncleanness and to take on his righteousness. And when we lay down, saints, we hit that next domino and we set this thing into motion, hallelujah. And the thing we set into motion is sanctification. Be ye holy as Yahweh is holy. And so the day that I laid my life down, I entered onto the straight and narrow path and I am being made holy day after day, week after week, month after month, taking on more and more and more of Yeshua's likeness and character. I will call that way obedience. So, two options, disobedience and obedience. Which one are you? See, our decisions that we make today affect not only our tomorrow, but also affect our eternal destiny. We need to be mindful that every single decision I make will determine if I'm getting closer to Yahweh or moving further from Yahweh. This is why it is key. It's so important for us to seek Yahweh's guidance before we make these life-changing decisions. Because every decision that you've made has brought you to the place where you're at today, whether it's in your marriage, relationship, how you meet people, where you work, where you live. All of these decisions make who you are today you. 
Adam and Eve found out the hard way that one bad choice could have lifelong repercussions. See, when the devil in the form of the serpent tempted Eve to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she knew that Yahweh forbid them to do that. She knew she did not sin out of ignorance. It was willful sin. She listened to the lie of the enemy as he beguiled her and tried to get her to think that Yahweh was withholding something good from her. He doesn't want you to eat from that because he doesn't want you to be a God like him. He doesn't want you to know good from evil like he does. So she felt like she was missing out on something. And so she goes and she partakes of the fruit. And the domino effect has begun. She set into motion the fall of all mankind. One decision. And it had dire consequences, not only for them, but for all of humanity. So Yahweh punishes Eve with pain during childbirth. But that punishment was passed on to every childbearing woman. His punishment for Adam was the necessity to work for his daily bread. And that was passed on to every man since Adam. When the serpent told them that they would not surely die, they actually died more than once. See, they died spiritually immediately. Immediately, they experienced alienation from Yahweh. You remember they tried to hit to hide. And then Yahweh put them outside of the garden and took their access to the tree of life away. So they were alienated from Yahweh. They were spiritually dead immediately. All of humanity now, as a result of that choice, is subject to physical death from now on. It is appointed unto man to die. We will all die unless you are alive when Yeshua returns. You will die in this life. We will die a physical death. This is a part of the domino effect. See, this goes back to the decision in Eden to disobey Yahweh. As a result, all of humanity will return to the dust. Yahweh said, from dust you are and to dust you shall return. See, there's consequences for all humanity. And Adam and Eve could not have known that this one poor choice, this one act of disobedience would affect all of humanity. This one decision. The fall of the first resulted in the fall of us all. We need to think about that. See, a lot of times when we make poor decisions, we think it only affects us, but that is not the truth. Every time we sin, it affects someone or something, and usually it's the people that are the closest to us. When you think about generational curses, you come from a dysfunctional family, and dysfunction breeds more dysfunction, which breeds more dysfunction and more dysfunction and more dysfunction, sometimes for 10 generations, right? So the sin of one person can destroy a whole line of a family. Not just their immediate family, but their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and their great-great-grandchildren. One person's sin can bring down an entire family line. One person's sin. Don't believe me? Think about Eli and his sons. His line was cut off because his sons were sinning and he was winking at it. And that's a lesson for us parents. If you're winking at your children's sin, Yahweh punished Eli by cutting off his family line. So it can happen. So one person's sin can affect the ripple effect. The ripple can go years and years and years. You could be dead and gone, and the repercussions of what you have done are still playing out in your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren, just like Adam and Eve. How long ago was that? And we still are falling, and we still must repent. We still need a saint. Why? Because of what they did all the way back in the garden. All of humanity was spiritually separated from Yahweh. But Yahweh, oh, Yahweh, in his grace and his mercy and his great love for us, saw our condition and loved us in spite of us and made a way for us to be reconciled back to him. All we need to do is repent. Repent. I want you to know that when Adam and Eve made this choice, it didn't only affect Adam and Eve or all of humanity. It also affected the whole of creation. Even creation is suffering the consequences of the fall. If you look at Genesis 3, 17 and 18, it says, And to Adam he said, 
because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Cursed is the ground because of you. Because you were hard-headed, because you did not listen, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Then in Romans, Paul reiterates, same thing. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. It's not the creation's fault. The creation did what the creation is created to do. You know, we sing it and so will I. The wind goes where he sends it, right? The creation does what the creation is supposed to do. So it wasn't willingly that the creation was subjected to futility. It's because of the sin of Adam and Eve. All of creation is fallen. But because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of Yahweh. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Sin brings death and ruin and destruction, and it never stops with you. We see the domino effect played out over and over and over throughout scripture. So we talked about how Yahweh has hidden within his word, his plan of redemption over and over and over a bit. But also we can look at the effects of sin throughout scripture over and over and over and over again. When you look at the people in the Bible in their lives and the bad choices that they made, you can see the repercussions of those choices to the next generation, to the whole city, to the whole nation. It never only affects you. Sin brings more sin, brings more sin, brings more sin. We have a perfect example in this in King David. We know that King David had a domino effect as the consequence of his sin. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. And in an attempt to cover up his sin, he had her husband, Uriah the Hittite, killed on the battlefield. And when he's confronted by the prophet Nathan, David is brought to a place of repentance. Hallelujah. His sins are forgiven because Yahweh is faithful. He's faithful and just. And if we are faithful to repent, he is faithful to forgive and restore us. So his sins are forgiven, but the consequences of his sin remain. Yahweh tells him that the child between him and Bathsheba will not live. Yahweh also tells him that the sword will never leave his house. And because Yahweh is not a man that he should lie, the child did not live. And the sword never left David's house. One of the greatest deterrents to committing sin is to ask yourself, am I prepared to deal with the consequences of my sin? A lot of times when we sin, we think, if I get caught. But it's not if, saints, it's when. It's not if, saints. It's when. You will be found out. See, you may be able to fool your parents, the pastor, your spouse, your boss, your neighbors, your children. But you cannot, you shall not, you will not ever successfully fool Yahweh. There's no such thing as a secret sin. And if you think you've got one, you have deceived yourself because Yahweh is omniscient, hallelujah, omnipresent and omnipotent, hallelujah. And he knows the deepest, darkest secrets that you hold. Confess those before him and repent. There's no secret sins. When and if will get you into trouble. See, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to use me and Micah's marriage because I believe that this natural marriage is a reflection of our relationship with Yahweh, the spiritual marriage. I'm the bride of Yeshua, right? So if I think it an idea to cheat on my husband, I might be able to get away with it, with him. But if I think when instead of if, when I'm found out and I see the hurt that I've caused, and not just to my husband, but also to my children. And my witness before my children is just wrecked now. And everything that I've ever said to them about the glory of Yahweh and the goodness of Yahweh and how Yahweh's able, it just means nothing now. I just brought it to naught. 
right? But not only my husband will be affected by that and, and, and my children and my relationship with Yahweh because I am an adulteress, right? All of those things are affected. But guess what? Now I affect my ministry. See, I've counseled many married couples on marriage. So now it's like practice what you preach. You read the books. You know what to do. You gave us exercises. What happened with you? Why didn't it work for you? Now I become a stumbling block to them. But wait a minute, wait a minute. What about the people outside of the church who hear about it? Because gossip travels. I mean, wouldn't that be some tea? The pastor's wife cheated on him. Oh, I could hear it now. People would revel in it outside the church. They, I knew that Denise wasn't no good. I knew she was going, oh, poor Micah, poor Mike. You know what I'm saying? They would talk bad about me. But guess what? Now I done brought reproach on the church. I done brought reproach on Yahweh and on the church. Because guess what? If I come to my senses, as I know the ministers would sit me down in the hot seat and I would be surrounded by them ministering to me and I would come to a place of repentance and I would say, Yahweh, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. My husband, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. My children, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. My church, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. And all of you as believers and children of the Most High must forgive me, right? And I'm still in the assembly, but the people on the outside they don't understand all of that I'm still sitting in the church I didn't brought reproach on the church they don't want to come here we wink at adultery your sin never only affects you when you get ready to do the wrong don't think if I get caught think when I get caught and play that out you want to entertain something Entertain the consequences of that choice. Think about the domino effect. Think about how it affects the next one and the next one and the next one. I'm going to tell you, that has kept me out of a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. Because not only do I love Yahweh, I love the church. I don't want to be a stumbling block to any of you. I don't want to be the reason people don't enter in. I don't want to be the blemish on the righteous robe of the bride of Yeshua. Your sin will find you out. So it's not if, it's when. When. Sometimes the consequences of our sin are for a lifetime. For a lifetime. Just like David, we get the forgiveness of Yahweh. But there's consequences that have to be played out for the rest of our life. You think about people who are out here fornicating and they get an STD, luggage, I call it, the ones that you can't cure, the ones that stay with you for the rest of your life. And you come to Yahweh and you repent for your fornication, but guess what? You got to live with that for the rest of your days. Consequences. If in my scenario, I, I, I repent and I ask Micah to forgive me and he says, I do forgive you, but... <laughs> But I'm going to exercise my option to divorce you for your unfaithfulness. And he'd be right to do so. That's what the word says. He could divorce legitimately for that. So Yahweh may forgive me and my husband may forgive me, but he may not stay married to me. Consequences for the rest of my days. So sometimes the consequences follow us for a lifetime. Oftentimes the consequences spill over and affect other people's lives. We have to remember the domino effect when we're making these decisions. In Ecclesiastes 9.18, it says, Wisdom is better than weapon of war, but one sinner, one, one sinner destroys much good. One sinner. One sinner and one sin can inflict widespread collateral damage. And we've already seen it with Adam and Eve, right? One sin set all of that into motion. The whole fall of mankind, the one bad apple spoils the whole bunch, right? The sinful actions of one person can set into motion a chain reaction that causes and affects many, many lives, causes much harm. See, there's nothing secret about sin. There's nothing safe about sin. And there's never anything solitary about sin. 
Sin is never only going to affect you, especially if you are a member of the body of Yeshua. You represent the body. So when you fall, you bring reproach on all of us. So we need to remember that. We see this tragically played out in the life of Achan in the book of Joshua. Achan is a man who during the siege of Jericho sees something he wants. He covets it. He takes it. That's a nice way to say he steals it. He steals it. So he steals it and he hides it. The thing that was devoted unto Yahweh. The thing that was not for him to possess. And because of one man's sin, defeat, dismay, and death resulted. It negatively affected many, many, many lives. See, the defeat of Israel by a lesser enemy. They should have easily wiped out Ai, right? But they were defeated, which brought about dismay. The people were like, wait a minute. Yahweh said he was going to give us all of this land. What happened? How did we lose? We're not supposed to lose. We're supposed to go in and possess, right? That's the promise. That's what Yahweh gave us. What did we do wrong? The dismay. Dismay in the hearts of the people who trusted Yahweh to deliver the enemy into their hands. This is damaging. Do you see how damaging this is? And then it brought death. 36 soldiers were killed in this battle. But not only the soldiers, all of Achan's family, his entire family was killed. And not just his kids and his wife, his servants were killed also. And their kids and their wives, his whole group was killed because of the sin of one man. Like Paul said, a little leaven can leaven the whole lump. Sin in the camp is why they lost the battle. And Yahweh told them he wouldn't give them another victory until they got the sin out of the camp. So for those who are struggling with disfellowship, this is the word of Yahweh. Sin is not allowed to remain in the camp. It's not that we don't all have sin in our life. We do, but we repent. Practicing sin, hiding sin, perfecting your sin, you can't stay. Repent or go. You can't stay because we want the favor and the blessing of Yahweh on the assembly. We want to be able to fulfill the purpose that he has for us as a body. Sin in the camp. Deal with it. That's what Yahweh says. Don't play with it. Don't coddle it. Don't nurture it. Get it out. Repent or get out. That's what we got to do. It's hard, I know. But guess what? Before all of us die, like Achan's family, the one who committed the sin that was in the camp, we need to deal with the few. The few for the many. Sin is never a controlled explosion. You know the little expression, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Sin is never a controlled explosion. By one man and woman, sin entered and ruined this entire planet. All of humanity is fallen. Creation is fallen. All of it from one person's sin. We have to recognize the potential domino effect of every decision that we make, and we need to make better decisions. Our decisions are important because they shape our character. The decisions you make today determine the person you will become tomorrow. So in a sense, you're writing your life story one day and one decision at a time. Who you are is a direct result and the sum total of every decision that you have ever made. Nature and nurture do kind of play a part. What I mean by nature and nurture, this is like something me and Michaela were talking about a while ago. And I was thinking about this. Nature is our genetics determine our behavior, right? Our, our genetics. Our personality traits and abilities are in our nature, right? And nurture is our environment or our upbringing and life experiences determine our behavior. We are nurtured to behave in a certain way. So 
I already said that other people's sin can affect you, right? And so nature and nurture play a part. I'm not going to say they don't play a part. But I want us to be careful here. And I want us to tread lightly because we need to understand that my nature, which is fallen, is in that watery grave. My nature, my genetic makeup, you know, my, my, my environment that I was in that Yahweh called me out of, out of darkness into his most marvelous light. See, I'm not bound by that environment anymore. I'm not bound by those genetics anymore. So nature and nurture play a part, but it's a very, very small part. Very small. See, there are those that would claim that they can't help themselves. It's not my fault that I act this way. It's my parents' fault. They did this to me. I act this way because of them, what they did or what they didn't do, right? I'm a victim. But we need to be careful here. Because, see, when we blame nature and nurture, we excuse our bad behavior. We remove all personal accountability, right? And we play the victim. But I'm going to tell you something, and this ain't no secret. There are no victims in the body of Yeshua. No victims. We are victorious in him. We are more than conquerors. We are overcomers. This is what the word of Yahweh says. We are not victims. Does that mean we're not going to go through some stuff? No, that does not mean that. You're going to go through valleys and hardships and struggles and pain and suffering and loss. But Sister Beth did a beautiful message on how even your valleys are hand-selected for you, for Yahweh's glory, and for your perfecting. If you believe that Yahweh is ordering your steps, if you believe that you are a part of his redemptive plan, then you walk it out no matter what it looks like. I'm no victim. I'm a child of the Most High. I'm victorious in him. I'm the representation of Yeshua. Yeshua was nobody's victim. He wasn't a victim of Calvary. Hallelujah. He willfully laid his life down. Scripture says they wouldn't have been able to take it except he laid it down. You are no victim. Get out of your own head and be clothed in the mind of Yeshua. When I look out in the world, I see example after example of people who have overcome the odds, who have been dealt a very difficult life, a bad hand, so to speak. And they will be facing impossible situations, but yet they will do something meaningful with their lives. They don't even have what we got. I'm talking about worldly people who don't have Yahweh, who've been dealt a bad hand but make lemonade out of lemons, right? But then you got people who profess to be the children of the Most High, who walk around and complain and murmur, and woe is me, and nothing ever goes how I wanted to go, and I don't understand. And I... What's wrong with us? What is wrong with us? It's like if you have an alcoholic father that has two children. Two children raised up in the same home, under the same rules, exposed to the same things, and they grow up. And one of them follows in their father's footsteps, becomes an alcoholic. But the other one never has a drink. How is this possible? How is it possible that two children raised in the same household, exposed to the same thing, raised by the same father, have two entirely different outcomes. See, one of them sees the father and uses that as an excuse, blames them for their decision to drink. See, Yahweh gave us all free will. My children's will is not attached to my will. I wish it was. My children have free will. They can choose. They can make their own decisions. They have free will. Yahweh gave us free will. So this person decides, I want to drink, and I'm just going to say, it's daddy's fault. Not my fault. Daddy's fault. The other son or daughter sees the father as his greatest motivation not to be an alcoholic. 
See, if you grew up in a broken home, you can perpetuate that dysfunction. I grew up in a broken home, so my kids going to grow up in a broken home, and my grandkids going to grow up in a broken home. Somebody has to step up and break the cycle. Somebody has to say enough. Somebody has to say no more. Somebody has to say it won't be mine. You have to be able to choose, decide to not do those things. So nature and nurture play a part, but a very little part. We are without excuse to people in the assembly because we have all power in heaven and earth in us. When I hear I can't, it's like, you don't got the Holy Spirit? But I can't. You don't got the Holy Spirit. I can do all things through Yeshua who strengthened me. I can put it down. I can walk away. I can do the right thing because I can do all things through Yeshua who strengthened me. I can break generational curses, right? I can do better for my children than what was done for me. I can make this line functional and not allow it to continue in dysfunction because I have the life of the world in me. And he can do all things. He can do all things. Our decisions reflect our character. We have a good example in Judas. Judas had so many advantages, just like we do. We are such a privileged people. Judas was chosen by Yeshua to be one of the 12. He walked with Yeshua and he knew him intimately for the duration of his earthly ministry. He heard the sermons. He saw the miracles and the signs and the wonders. He was even able to do some of those things. Yeshua gave them the power to do some of those things. He had direct access to Yeshua, which is a privilege that is denied to the masses. He could just have a conversation with them. Can you have a conversation with Donald Trump? I don't think so. You can't just walk up and knock on his door and talk to him. You know what I mean? He had direct access to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he was willing, with all of this advantage, to sell Yeshua out for 30 pieces of silver. How could he even think to do that? It seems unthinkable if you look at it as an isolated incident. But things are rarely an isolated incident. In reality, nothing is an isolated incident. It's the domino effect at work. The domino effect. See, this was the culmination of a series of events, character-forming decisions. John tells us that Judas was a thief. He was in charge of the money box, and he was helping himself to it, right? And Matthew tells us that Judas went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me? if I deliver him to you. See, the chief priest didn't go to Judas. Judas went to the chief priest. So the whole idea of paying somebody to betray Yeshua was not the chief priest's idea. It was Judas's idea. And that little detail matters because that little detail shows his character. Him stealing money from the money box shows his character, right? Money was his God, not Yeshua. Money was his God. So, this final chapter of his life did not destroy his character. It revealed his character. It revealed his character. See, when people go off the deep end and do some really crazy thing, you're like, wow, what happened? I can't even think about that person doing that. Yes, you could. Because the evidence before that big jump is always there. People's character speaks volumes if you pay attention. I believe that's why the scripture says those that are faithful in the little things, to them much will be given. Because you can look at a person's life and see where their heart's desire is, what they're pursuing after, what they're chasing, what's most important to them. What is on the throne of Yahweh's heart? Judas was diminished to a person who would betray his friend for personal gain. And we have to be careful that the same thing doesn't happen to us. Because guess what? I don't know if you guys know it, but 30 pieces of silver was wealth back then. That was a lot of money. Wealth. How many times have you betrayed Yeshua for far less? 
far less. Betray Yeshua because you want to do what you want to do. Betray Yeshua because you think you're getting away with stuff. Lying, cheating, stealing, doing all manner of evil. Every time we sin, we betray Yeshua. Every time we sin, it's another lash of the whip on his back. Every time we sin, we crucify the Son afresh. Every time we sin, we have to be careful. The decisions we make every day are shaping not only our character, but also our destiny. You're either growing closer to Yahweh or you're growing further from him. Our decisions, especially where sin is involved, almost always have inescapable consequences. In Proverbs 1, Solomon says, Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of Yahweh, would have none of my counsel and despised all of my reproof. Let's just pause there. Hated my knowledge. We know that the word of Yahweh is knowledge, right? Well, they dislike strongly the word. Why? Because it goes against their nature and what they want to do. So they despise the knowledge. They do not fear Yahweh. This is the reverence. This is understanding that Yahweh is high and lifted up. He's not to be trifled with. He's not our peer. He's the creator of heaven and earth who holds your very breath in his hands. He is to be worshipped and esteemed and venerated and glorified and honored. And not just with your lips, but with your life. With your life. But they didn't have that. They didn't have reverence for Yahweh. They give more reverence to the pastor than to Yahweh Almighty. More reverence to their boss at work than Yahweh Almighty. More reverence to their friends than Yahweh Almighty. Would have none of my counsel. Won't receive the counsel of Yahweh. You show them the word of Yahweh. Oh, I know. But they keep on doing the same pattern of behavior, the same destructive pattern of behavior, the same bad decision over and over and over and over. And over. They will not receive the counsel. And they despise all my reproof. Reproof is correction. They despise correction. So the pastor comes to you and he says, hey, what you doing? You got to repent. You got to get right. They despise correction. What happens to them? Let's go on. 31. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. Yahweh lets them live their life and do what they want to do. But guess what? That choice, their destiny is not heaven. See, there's a destiny attached to that decision. And it ain't a good one. But Yahweh gave you free will and he will let you go whatever way you want to go. He's not going to fight you. He wants you to choose him like he chose you. Like he chose you. Solomon even goes on to say, because you have ignored all my counsel. This is in the same chapter, just a couple verses ahead. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof or correction, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. This is some scary stuff right here. Yahweh will laugh at your calamity. See, this goes into the disfellowship. When you are in the body of Yeshua, you have the favor of Yahweh in your life. His provision, his protection, his leading, his guiding. But when you make a choice to reject him and go back to the vomit, right? Go back into the world. Go back into the darkness. The favor of Yahweh is removed from you. And then life happens. Sin has its way with you. And sin brings more sin and more sin and more sin. And you spiral downward deeper and deeper and deeper into the depths of darkness and disparity. Because you chose to reject the things of Yahweh. And the scripture says Yahweh will laugh at your calamity. 
Now, people might think that's harsh, but we need to remember that Proverbs is the wisdom of Yahweh. This is the wisdom of Yahweh. This is greater than our wisdom or our understanding or our knowledge. This is the wisdom of Yahweh. A lot of people would speak against that and say, well, that's not very loving. Yahweh loves. Yahweh forgives. It's a wonderful thing that sinners can be forgiven. Prodigals can always come home. Prodigals can always come home. Home. The blood of Yeshua is greater than all of our sins. And there's a reason why we call the gospel the good news. We call it the good news because it is. It is good news. But never forget that Yahweh is not a man that he should lie. And although sin can be forgiven, there are consequences. We already talked about King David after he repented that his baby died and the sword never left his house. But guess what? Those weren't the only consequences. His consequences didn't end there. His family life was riddled with one problem after another after another, including incest, rape, murder, rebellion, and grief. And we should learn from this example. Yahweh forgives those who repent. He removes the threat of spiritual punishment, right? But he doesn't always remove the consequences of our sin. Our decisions determine our destiny. You do not need a GPS to tell you that certain decisions are going to lead you away from Yahweh. You already know that before you do it. When Achan took the devoted things of Yahweh after the battle of Jericho, how did he think it was going to turn out? I mean, think about Achan for a minute. Achan was with them in the wilderness. That means he got manna from heaven and quail from heaven and he drank water from a rock. He saw the miracles and the wonders and the signs. He knew Yahweh was real when Yahweh made his presence known and the earth shook and trembled when he came down on Sinai. So he knew not by faith, but by sight, that Yahweh was real. How did he think this was going to end? How did he think for one second he was going to get away with this? Stealing from Yahweh. Robbing Yahweh. But we, we do the same stupid stuff. You know, we, we throw away our calling for pleasures of sin. Like our brother Samson. See, Samson gave into his affection in his heart. This is why I'm always telling my girls, seek Yahweh with all your heart. Don't have a divided heart. Yahweh wants it all. He gave it all and he wants it all. When you have a divided heart, Yahweh loses every time. Every time. Because Yahweh does not occupy a divided heart. That's a lie we tell ourselves. See, you don't have Yahweh in the world. You just think you do. You either have Yahweh or the world. There's no such thing as a divided heart. If any part of your heart belongs to the world, none of it is Yahweh's. None of it. That's just what we tell ourselves. So he goes with the affection of his heart and reveals the secret of his strength to Delilah. He had to have known. Come on, saints. He had to have known the risk he was taking because... She already betrayed him three times before that, if you know the story. Three different times he told her to strength and it was false, and she tried to do it. Three different times. So what did he think was going to happen? So this one reckless decision cost him his supernatural strength, his eyesight, his freedom, his dignity, and ultimately his life. Let us not make the same foolish mistakes. Don't be an Achan. Don't be a Samson. Don't be Adam and Eve. Don't be Ananias and Sapphira. Don't make a choice that is going to change your destiny. You already made the most important choice you will ever have to make in your life. And that is surrendering your life to Yahweh. We did that. We're here. Don't go back. Don't be a fool. Don't fool yourself into thinking that the road that you're on is going to end some other way. See, if you have secret sin in your life, you're living for yourself all week long, and you're just coming in here, hallelujah, and going back to what you do, your end is hellfire. 
The sad, unfortunate thing is there's going to be a lot of people who sit in the pews week after week, but hell is their destiny because church don't save nobody. Hear me, saints. Church don't save nobody. Yeshua saves. Yahweh saves. Church is to shore you up, to build you up, to pour into you, to bring greater understanding to work together with you in the ministry that Yahweh has for us. That's the purpose of the church. Church saves nobody. Many people sitting in the pews, hell is their destiny. You must repent. Repent. Turn around. Turn around. Go back the other way. I want you guys to remember that when you pick a path in life, you are also choosing a destiny. And there are only two roads. One is wide, the other is narrow. And those two roads are leading to two different destinies, destruction and life, obedience, disobedience, sheep, wolf, goat. There's always been either or. You're either a child of Yahweh or a child of the devil. There's no gray, there's no middle area. You're either in or you're out, almost in is out. You are on one of those two roads right now as we speak. The choices you are making, the decisions you are making are directing you. Choose ye this day whom you will serve and choose your destiny. Hallelujah.